slash healing.html. And that website's going to be on the last slide, too. So uh, you'll get a chance to see that again. I'm going to just start by sharing with you this quote describing a healing presence by writer Henry Nguyen. He writes that a healing presence is someone who can be silent with us in a moment of despair or confusion, who can stay with us in an hour of grief or bereavement, who can tolerate not knowing and face with us the reality of our powerlessness. And of course, all of us would like to have someone in our life who provides this type of healing presence. But today I'm going to talk about three different practices that allow you to be that healing presence for yourself, to offer yourself this kind of companionship and friendship in difficult moments. And those three sources of strength and healing, the three practices I'll talk about today are yoga, mindfulness meditation, which you've already literally gotten a taste of at lunch, and uh, self-compassion, which we don't often think of as a practice, but I'll share with you some practices that help cultivate the quality of befriending yourself and taking good care of yourself. And as we go through, I'll, I'll introduce to you just basically what these practices are, dispel a few myths and give you a sense of what they are. I'll describe to you some of the most interesting research on how they can support people who are healing from cancer as well as their caregivers. And then I'll give you a short practice that we can do together. And then you can think about which practices you like. And I'll share with you resources for exploring any of those practices further, uh, both on your own or in community settings. So let's start with yoga. This is the type of picture we often see uh, when we look on the cover of Yoga Journal or we see advertisements about yoga. And I just want to make very clear that that's not the type of yoga I'm talking about, unless it's your thing and you want to join the circus. I'm talking more about this kind of yoga, uh, something that is accessible to everyone. And there's always a yoga practice that is accessible. And what makes yoga healing is three core types of practices that you would find in any yoga class or any yoga DVD or any yoga book you pick up. And all three of them, when they, when they come together, is what makes yoga so healing. And the first is the focus on the breath. If the breath is not the focus, it's not yoga. And we know that the breath is the most direct and easiest way to shift both what's happening in the body as well as in the mind. And there's ample evidence that when you change the quality of your breath, you can activate the immune system, you can downregulate the stress response system, uh, you can increase well-being immediately just by working with the breath. And so that's really the foundation of any yoga practice. Most yoga practices also include conscious movement. We think about the stretching or the fancy poses or the very unfancy poses. And it can be as simple as taking your shoulders up to your ears on an in-breath and dropping your shoulders down on an out-breath. And you might even try that now and just notice how good that can feel. Inhale, lifting up and exhale, letting go. And then the last component that you would find in any yoga practice is relaxation. And the relaxation response, which is triggered anytime you can lie down with a little bit of support for your body and a little bit of guidance for the mind so the mind doesn't fly off into fantasies and, and other habits of distraction. Just quieting the mind and quieting the body triggers a physiological response in the body that promotes healing and restoration. And so these are the three things you'd find in any yoga practice. And one of the uh, first ways that I think of yoga as being healing, particularly for cancer survivors, is thinking about yoga as exercise. Even really gentle yoga counts as physical activity. You don't need to break a sweat in order to move your body or to get the benefits of physical activity. And you may have seen some of the research suggesting that as little as three hours a week of really moderate physical activity uh, can significantly reduce the risk of death for several types of cancer, including breast and colon cancer. And that's a 50% reduced risk of mortality from doing something for just three hours a week. And most cancer researchers believe that physical activity is the, uh, is the only lifestyle factor that has been strongly identified to predict outcomes. And of course, it's not just living longer, but living better. Physical activity is associated with higher quality of life, less pain, better physical functioning, and better general health among cancer survivors. And even during cancer treatment, when we're not often encouraged to stay a little bit physically active, for those who are able to maintain any sort of physical activity, including very gentle yoga, that's associated with a lot of benefits during cancer treatment, including chemotherapy. Uh, and that could include decreased anxiety and depression during treatment, 
fewer side effects from fatigue to nausea, uh, improved sleep quality, less pain, less um, uh, uh, improved immune functioning, and, and all sorts of other things that become challenged during uh, aggressive cancer treatment. And then finally, I just wanted to point out, and this is not to guilt anyone who's not physically active because you are in the wide majority if that's you, uh, but research suggests only 22% of cancer survivors uh, over any length of time, whether the last treatment was last week or 30 years ago, only 22% of cancer survivors are physically active. And because this is the one risk factor we've identified that has uh, is such a strong predictor of positive outcomes, anything that you're willing to do uh, can be such an important step that you take for yourself. And gentle yoga can sometimes be the first level of physical activity that feels right or that feels encouraging because it can always be adapted to the individual. So that's just one thing that I like to think about. Yoga is exercise. Um, but of course, yoga is not just exercise. And I'll share with you some of the other practices of yoga that we can do now, since we're not going to be doing exercise in this room. Uh, and here are some other findings uh, that research suggests yoga can support, both uh, in cancer treatment and following cancer treatment. And that includes improved mood, less anxiety, less depression, uh, more energy and less fatigue, improved sleep, reduced treatment symptoms, as I mentioned, especially symptoms from chemotherapy, including chemo brain or that brain fog that often happens after treatment, and especially enhanced quality of life. And here's a specific study that just came out that I think points to one of the mechanisms that this might be working by. So this was a study of women with stage two to stage four breast cancer. And these women were randomly assigned either to uh, a yoga group that met twice a week for eight weeks, or to a weightless control group. And then they got the yoga treatment afterward. And the yoga class that they were assigned to was Iyengar yoga, which is a form of yoga that emphasizes adapting poses to the individual. So no matter who you are, whether you're in a wheelchair, whether or not you can get off of the floor, or whether you're very fit and very active already, poses are always adapted to where you are when you walk into the room uh, and can be adapted to meet your energy and your physical capacity that day. Uh, so that was the type of practice they were assigned to, and it was a moderately vigorous practice. And then at baseline, before the yoga intervention began, and then at eight weeks after the yoga intervention, the participants reported how they were doing emotionally, how they were feeling, how much energy they had. But importantly, the researchers also had the women give cortisol samples four times a day for two days in a row at the beginning of the study and at the end of the study. And this is an interesting physiological measure because we know that cortisol levels among breast cancer survivors is very predictive of outcomes, including mortality. So here's what they found. Oops, we don't want to skip the results. So the, this, uh, this adaptive yoga program, uh, doing the practice a couple times a week for eight weeks, was associated with improved emotional well-being. They were less depressed, less anxious, and that's great. They also had more energy. But looking at the physiological measure, you see that they had lower cortisol levels upon waking and in the evening. And cortisol is a stress hormone. So whenever you're stressed out, whenever you're anxious, whenever you're overwhelmed, the body is probably pumping out a little bit more of the stress hormone. And the stress hormone also interferes with cognitive function. So when you have high levels of cortisol, it can really impair memory and focus. And so this study found that, again, after just eight weeks of a couple of gentle yoga practices per week, that baseline cortisol levels, when the women woke up, that they were already lower, and that they stayed lower throughout the day uh, when, when cancer survivors are at risk of having an increase in cortisol throughout the day. That's been observed. And again, this is a physiological outcome that is predictive of the outcomes we really care about. And it's not just among cancer patients and survivors that we see this type of benefit. It can also really help those of you who are caregivers in the supportive role, either as professional caregivers or helping a loved one. And so this is a study that compared 50 women who either regularly practice restorative yoga, which is one of my favorite types of yoga. It's basically, as you can see here, lying around in a bunch of different positions, <laughs> using as many pillows and props as you can find. Uh, it requires zero effort, uh, but feels really great. And so they were comparing women who either did this practice on a regular basis or didn't. And the main benefit of restorative yoga is, is thought to be decreasing stress. So they decided to put these women through a stress test, a variety of stress tests. One of the first things they found is that women who regularly practice 
lying on the ground with lots of pillows and breathing, that they had lower levels of a chemical associated with inflammation and stress in the body, interleukin-6. And higher levels of this chemical are associated not just with greater risk for depression and anxiety and psychological stress, but it significantly increases risk for stress-related diseases like heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes. Okay, so this is just baseline, walking around in the world. People are already looking a little bit more stress resilient. But then they decided to, to put these women through specific stress tests. For example, making them uh, hold a hand or a foot in a bucket of ice water for as long as they could, which is really stressful, and don't try it at home. But uh, it really challenges your ability to stay put in a very difficult situation where you're not comfortable at all. And I think that pretty much describes most stressful situations. And there were other stress tests as well. What they found is that women who regularly practice this restorative yoga, that their bodies had smaller stress responses to these stressful situations. So they had less of an increase in this uh, chemical associated with inflammation and stress. And again, as I mentioned, this is a really important measure because of how inflammation is connected to both psychological distress and physical health. So we've got two studies here suggesting that both for cancer survivors as well as for caregivers, that a very basic adaptive gentle yoga practice can really change how the body is handling the stress that you're going through. And I want to give you uh, some advice about the styles of yoga that have the most evidence for it. Because if you've never done yoga before and you look at a studio website or you get a schedule and there are maybe 30 different styles and brand names and do you want to do hot yoga or hatha yoga or anything in between. And there are three basic styles of yoga that actually have some good evidence for them. And they also happen to be the styles of yoga that are most accessible to people who may not be gymnastics or heading for the circus with their legs behind their head. Uh, and so the first type of yoga that has the most evidence for it, specifically with cancer patients and cancer survivors, is restorative yoga. And I think that's good news because, again, that's the form of yoga where your teacher is going to invite you to lie down in a lot of different positions. And uh, it's easy to pick up a DVD in restorative yoga and do it at home with cushions from the couch or pillows from the bed. Uh, so if you're going to start somewhere, restorative yoga is a really great place to start. Iyengar yoga also has uh, some good evidence behind it, working with cancer patients and survivors. Uh, and again, that's a form of yoga that emphasizes being very intentional about the alignment of the body and using a lot of props so that poses are accessible. And you'll get a lot of individual attention in an Iyengar class. And the emphasis isn't on push, 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 go, 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 but just making things work for your body. And Vini yoga is another form of yoga that emphasizes adapting the practice to the individual. It's a little bit harder to find Vini yoga classes than the other two forms of yoga classes, but if you see one, grab it. And that will focus on, uh, on really simple breath-based practices. Uh, and if you're interested in getting more information about yoga, specifically for cancer patients, survivors, and caregivers, I invite you to check out this website, yogabear.org. This is an organization that I work with, and they're nationwide, but they were founded in the Bay Area, so they have a lot of opportunities for people in the Bay Area. And they help match cancer patients and survivors and caregivers with free yoga classes at yoga studios around the country, and a lot in the Bay Area. And so you can just submit an application, and instead of having to go for a special class for people who are cancer survivors or patients, they'll just give you passes, free passes, to go to any class you want at a studio that you've been matched with. Uh, and they also have videos on their website that can take you through a home practice if you'd like. So that's a great resource if you're interested in, in pursuing yoga. And now as promised, I want to take you through a very brief yoga practice that you can do exactly where you are. I mentioned that breathing is probably the most important element of a healing yoga practice, so let's do a short breathing practice together. And I'm going to encourage you first to just adjust your body so that you feel grounded and you feel comfortable. Sometimes it's easy to forget that you're making a choice about the position your body's in, and we can fall into these uncomfortable kind of positions. So when you found the position that feels comfortable for you, also make a conscious choice about the placement of your hands. And if it works for you, put your hands on your belly or maybe at your lap, right at the base of your belly. And then go ahead and either close your eyes or drop your gaze either to your own body or to the table in front of you. 
And we're going to take two simple breathing practices, belly breathing and heart breathing. And the first thing is to notice that you're already breathing. It's a miracle. You don't have to do it on purpose. And so take a few breaths in your own mind, labeling the breath. Inhale as you breathe in. And exhale as you breathe out. Name the breath in your own mind. Inhale and exhale. And then for those of you who have your hands resting on your belly, investigate, is there any movement happening here right now? Is there any movement around the belly, an expansion when you breathe in? And that expansion dissolving as you breathe out. If it's there already, just watch it. You can feel it through your hands or fingers. And you can even feel it from the inside out, the feeling of the belly expanding as you breathe in. And that expansion dissolving as you breathe out. And if you aren't sure, if you can't feel that, you might take the image of inhaling through your navel as if you could move your nostrils to your belly button and inhale through the navel and exhale through the navel. Take a few more conscious breaths in this way. That's belly breathing. That's the most basic yoga breathing technique. And research suggests that that technique, which is not fancy, doesn't require uh, doing anything or even controlling the breath in any way, that that is very supportive in the healing process. And to come into heart breathing, just take one or both of your hands now and place it closer to your physical heart, maybe over the sternum or under the collarbones. And often there's a much more subtle movement of the breath here. And investigate that. Is there any feeling of the heart area broadening or lifting as you breathe in? And that area melting or sinking as you breathe out. Bless you. And then return your hands to your lap. And let's take that image of breathing in and out now of the center of the chest. Imagine that you could move your nostrils to the center of your chest. And what would it feel like if you were breathing in directly to your heart? And then breathing out directly from the heart. And can you find that feeling of expansion around the heart center? This breathing technique, which is also sometimes called the breath of joy, has been shown to increase feelings of well-being, to help lift our mood, and also to give us a sense of spaciousness or acceptance in difficult moments. And this particular breath, the idea of breathing into and out of the heart, is one that I often turn to uh, in difficult moments, whether physical pain or anxiety or grief. The third breathing practice that I've listed here is one that I'll leave you to investigate if you like on that website that I mentioned that I'll show you the URL for again. It's a more complicated yoga breathing technique. It looks like you know it. <laughs> um, we've got a demonstration going on. I have a picture of that. Yeah, oh, that's right, we do, yes. Um, so if you're interested in this breathing technique, it's one of the MP3s that is on the website that, uh, that I shared with you, and it's a longer practice. And it's a practice that's been shown to reduce blood pressure, lower anxiety, lower heart rate, and again, is, is very, can be very helpful. Um, and I know some patients who <coughs> use particularly this breathing technique 
uh, when undergoing treatments that are stressful, including chemotherapy. Okay, so let's turn now to mindfulness, which you've already been introduced to. So I'll just throw at you a couple of other ideas to think about when we're trying to define mindfulness as a practice or as a quality. And the first is that mindfulness is very basically paying attention to and accepting whatever is happening, whatever is present. All the things that we usually turn our attention away from, the distractions that we turn to, mindfulness is just about showing up and checking out what's actually happening. So right now, if you can feel your feet on the ground, that's mindfulness. If you're attending to what I'm saying, that's mindfulness. If you notice that the room is a little bit warm, that's mindfulness. Another aspect of mindfulness that you uh, enjoyed over your meal is the idea of savoring or appreciating whatever is pleasant, whatever is good in the moment, and to actually look for it. You know, sometimes we don't have the habit of looking for what's good, especially when we're under a lot of stress or overwhelmed. And so mindfulness can include this act of appreciation, of looking around and noticing what's beautiful, noticing who's around you and how you care about them, uh, even just enjoying the feeling of the breath. And of course, the other side of that savoring of the good is willingness to be with and experience the stuff we often don't want to experience, the stuff we'd rather not be happening. And that's as much a part of mindfulness as savoring the good. Because when I'm in pain, I'm going to actually notice where it hurts and what it feels like, rather than automatically trying to distract myself with food or worries or entertainment and say, this is what pain feels like in my body. And I'm actually going to look at it. And the last quality of mindfulness that's really important is letting go of the mental habits that just create more suffering. Okay, so it may be that it's warm in this room. And you may be in a little bit of physical pain right now. You can notice that without launching into stories about how awful it is that it's warm in the room. Or does this pain mean that something is getting worse? And if I don't know what it means, I need to worry about it as if I could somehow figure it out by worrying about it. And there are all sorts of habits we have that just take whatever is present and spiral us into more suffering than is actually needed in a given moment. Okay, so how do we learn these qualities? The best way to learn these qualities is to take an eight-week program that is offered all around the world at hospitals, at schools, at churches, at community centers, uh, called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. Have any of you taken that program? Okay. Oh, good, then there's a lot of opportunity here. So mindfulness-based stress reduction introduces a lot of different mindful practices from mindful meditation on the breath, mindful walking. It includes some really gentle yoga. It includes a wonderful relaxation practice where you attend to your body. Uh, and it includes um, mindful eating, mindful communication, how to listen and how to share uh, how, what you're feeling with other people, how to have difficult conversations. Basically, any aspect that we might want to bring mindfulness to, this program will help you with. And it's been very widely studied. It was originally developed at a hospital for people who had chronic illness or pain. Okay, so I'm going to share with you a couple of studies looking at the benefits of this particular program in mindfulness training for both cancer patients, survivors, and caregivers. And this first study uh, looked at women who had been diagnosed with early stage breast cancer and were not currently receiving chemotherapy. And these women were given the opportunity to take this mindfulness-based stress reduction class. And so the people who enrolled were women who decided to do it. And that's kind of important because if somebody forces you into it, things sometimes don't work as well. It's really nice to step up and say, this is something I want to do to support myself. Okay, and the, uh, the measures, the outcomes they were especially interested in were physiological measures, both of immune functioning at a time when immune functioning is really important, uh, as well as stress hormones and inflammation in the body. And so uh, here are some of the data. The first thing I want to orient you to is that these black bars, that these are the women who took the mindfulness-based stress reduction program, the white bars, those are the women who did not take the mindfulness program. And this last blue bar here, this is women who don't have cancer. We can think of that as being the healthy norm that, uh, that women with breast cancer in treatment may be aspiring to return to. And what you'll see is that over time, the black bars are getting higher, even surpassing the blue bar, the women who are cancer free, whereas the white bars are staying the same or declining. 
This particular measure is the effectiveness of natural killer cells against cancer cells. And so they, they took the blood of women and they put the blood in test tubes with cancer cells and said, all right, immune system, go. How good are you at killing the cancer cells? So this is a really important outcome. And you'll see that the women who took the mindfulness-based stress reduction program have now even surpassed what uh, cancer-free women are showing. And you'll see, oh, and there you go. Those are those lines. Okay. Uh, and here are the other two uh, outcomes which show a similar finding. Now, these are both outcomes where lower is better. And on the top graph, what you're looking at is levels of inflammation. It's actually that same chemical I talked about earlier, interleukin-6, that is associated with increased inflammation in the body, which means worse pain, less energy, increased risk of heart disease, and, and other, um, other problems. And so you'll see that the women who took the mindfulness-based stress reduction program they show a significant decline approaching levels in women who do not have cancer, whereas the women who did not undergo that program show uh, a significant increase in inflammation over time. And you see the same pattern with stress hormones. There's women who took the mindfulness program, their stress hormones decline over time, uh, beginning to approach the levels of women who do not have cancer. Whereas the, the cancer patients who did not take this program, you see an increase or a steady state in stress hormones. And I love the study just because, you know, it, we all know in some way that breathing, lying down, relaxing, they make us feel better. But it's really important to see that they actually are, are influencing systems of the body that are really important for long-term recovery. There's also some emerging evidence that mindfulness meditation may help with things like brain fog or chemo brain, whether uh, these symptoms are coming from the treatment or from the cancer itself. And uh, clinicians are beginning to recommend meditation to patients as a way to try to regain memory, regain focus um, after they've undergone treatment. And so I'm going to show you two studies now that we're not using cancer patients because we don't yet have data looking specifically at cancer patients. Um, but these are two relevant uh, populations and really interesting findings about how meditation changes the brain. So this first study, oops, 27 participants who reported being really, really stressed out, uh, took the mindfulness-based stress reduction program that I described, and they had no previous meditation experience whatsoever. Researchers did pre and post brain scans looking at the size of different areas of the brain that are important for memory and self-awareness. Uh, and they actually are, are able to measure the density of these regions of the brain. How many neurons do you have? And as we age and as we undergo sometimes treatment, these areas of the brain can shrink. That happens to all of us, whether or not you've, you've undergone cancer treatment. And so what the study found is that there was an increased gray matter density Somehow these participants had grown new neurons or they had increased the thickness of the connections between these neurons so that brain regions associated with memory and self-awareness were literally denser. They were, they were better connected or bigger in the brain after just eight weeks. And it's kind of phenomenal that the brain can reshape itself in this way, but it does seem that the brain responds to exercise in the same way that muscles do that when you ask the brain to do something that's a little bit difficult, like focus your mind on the breath, that the brain says, I guess we have to get better at this focus stuff, and the brain adapts in response. And these are just uh, some of those brain regions, and here you can see the, the increase in gray matter density in the hippocampus, which is probably the most important area of the brain for memory. Okay, so the next study was looking at older adults who were in early stage dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And uh, those adults, again, took an eight-week meditation program that only taught focused meditation, uh, didn't include any of the other mindfulness trainings. People were just sitting there, focusing on their breath. And they also did before and after brain scans, but this time the researchers were interested in looking at activity of the brain. Are these systems of the brain that are important for focus and concentration, are they more active once people have uh, begun to meditate? And they also gave participants before and after tests of cognition and memory. And here's what they found. So here you're looking at pictures of, uh, of glucose use in the brain. How much energy is the brain using? 
And the top picture is from before the meditation training, and the bottom picture is from after the meditation training. And these are composites of all of the brains of all of the participants. And red means more active. So when you see these areas here that are labeled, the prefrontal cortex, which is the most important area of the brain for both focus and for controlling your emotions and regulating stress. Prefrontal cortex, most important. And one of the, the areas of the brain that is the quickest to decline with age or with illness. So you see that that's more active, as well as the anterior cingulate cortex, which is really important, again, for self-awareness and for self-control. And again, this is with people who are already demonstrating uh, decline in cognitive function, and just eight weeks of training was retraining the brain. They also showed improvement in all, all of the cognitive tests. So after eight weeks of meditating, they had improved memory, improved attention, and improved verbal fluency. They're just, they're better with words. Their language is a little bit more, uh, more easy to use. Okay, and then of course, we should consider whether this program can help uh, the caregivers who are also under a lot of stress. So this particular study uh, looked at caregivers who, uh, who also took the eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction program that I described. And one thing that's interesting just to point out, although I, I probably don't need to point it out to this audience, the caregivers were under levels of stress equivalent to cancer patients. Uh, you know, it's, it is sometimes as stressful to be the caregiver as the person who is receiving treatment. Yes? How did you count, you know, variable in terms of determining what level of stress they're under? Self-reported stress. So, you know, people give you a survey like, when you think about the challenges you're facing in life, how overwhelmed do you feel? One to five. Uh, in the last two weeks, how often have you felt like you were, you were drowning in your responsibilities? One to five. Also, it's questions like that. Um, and, and the caregivers were reporting levels of overwhelm and anxiety and depression equivalent to patients. So you didn't like measure levels of cortisol or anything like that? In this particular study, I don't believe that there were any physiological measures. Perception? Yeah, yeah, perception. Which, of course, is something, I mean, if you think yourself, you can ask yourself, how stressed am I? How overwhelmed am I? I think most people do a pretty good job of being like, yeah, I'm, I'm stressed. Um, so over this eight-week program, Caregivers reported significant reduction in all of those, those self-reported measures, depression, stress, anger, fatigue. They were less overwhelmed, and they also had less physical symptoms, because caregivers often develop health problems as well, just from the stress. Uh, and so they were less tired, they had less gastrointestinal problems, they were in less pain, all the things that go along with being overwhelmed and in stress. And one of the most interesting things in this particular study was the finding that uh, the caregivers were really using the practices in caregiving situations. That is, they would go to belly breathing when they were in the hospital and when they started to feel overwhelmed and started to feel like uh, it was hard for them to be the healing presence they wanted to be for the person they were caring for. And so they were using these practices, not just at home to get stronger, but really in the moment, checking in with my breath, checking in with my thoughts and feelings. Okay, so if you're interested in, in taking this program uh, that has resulted in the various outcomes I've described, uh, one of the best places to do it is at the website for mindfulness-based stress reduction, the original founders of the program. And again, this, all these slides are up in that original website as well as a link to this. So if you don't want to write down this link, if you just go to that first website I shared with you, uh, right at the top of that page will be a link to this organization. And then you just type in your city or your state, and they'll tell you all the MBSR groups that are available. And again, there are just a ton in the Bay Area. You, you can barely go anywhere without tripping over an MBSR class. Um, but you can also do a lot of this on your own if you don't want to take a class or don't have the time to take a class. These are just two books that I like, and it's not that they are necessarily the only books to turn to, but I want you to have a sense that there are a lot of resources that are available. This book is a mindfulness-based stress reduction work uh, workbook, which was written by one of the, the best Bay Area teachers in MBSR. And then there are also books about mindfulness uh, solution to pain, mindfulness solution for anxiety, mindfulness solution to almost anything you can think of. Someone's written a book about it. Uh, and so if a class isn't for you, there are still lots of resources. And if you want to try mindfulness-based stress reduction on your own at home, uh, here's something you can do. 
And we're not going to do it uh, today because I think if I have you lie down, I may have a hard time waking you up. <laughs> that is a time of the day. Okay, but so the, uh, it's great to lie down. We often think of meditation having to be very formal and seated and upright. Well, MBSR says, first meditation practice, you get to lie down or any position you want to be in. And then you return to that relaxed belly breathing that we practiced earlier. You don't need to control the breath. You just let the belly rise and fall as you breathe. And then your thoughts are directed at sensing the breath and sensing the body. And you can even imagine the breath moving through the body or sending the breath to different parts of the body. And if this practice sounds appealing to you, I have uh, an MP3 on that website I gave you that'll talk you right through this. Sometimes hearing someone's voice helps you stay awake for it. And staying awake turns out to be better than taking a nap for this practice. So that's the simplest mindfulness-based stress reduction practice you can do. The last practice that I want to talk about is self-compassion. And uh, Kristen Neff, who is a researcher, a psychologist who studies self-compassion, she just came out with a brand new book called Self-Compassion. It's a great resource if you're interested in exploring this further. And she defines self-compassion as having three core qualities or ways of relating to yourself and your experience. And the first is mindfulness of whatever is happening, but especially mindfulness of stress, pain, suffering, all the stuff that we often want to distract ourselves from. And mindfulness of these difficult experiences is not quite the same thing as wallowing in it. You probably know what it's like to wallow in self-pity. Oh, this is so awful. Oh, why me? You know, everything is horrible and it's only going to get worse. That's not mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness is just actually being willing to see what is happening and being willing to experience it, looking at the body and, and how the body feels when you're under stress. The second part is probably the most important and the most foreign part for folks, and that's the idea that our suffering is what connects us to others, not what isolates us from others. So rather than asking why me or feeling really isolated because of what you're going through, uh, a self-compassionate approach to suffering says, you know what? Illness is part of being human. No one gets out of here without experiencing it. Grief is part of what it means to be human. Stress is part of what it means to be human. And however isolated I may feel, there are countless other people who are in the same boat. And I may not know them all, but that is true. And so uh, a big part of self-compassion is being able to remember that when it feels like you're the only one, or that nobody understands what you're going through, or that life is unfair. And the last quality is self-kindness. And that's the, the uh, ability to take care of yourself and give yourself what you need, whether it's, whether it's really encouraging yourself to eat the foods that are nourishing, whether it's giving yourself permission to do the things that matter to you, whether it's a hobby that you've always put off, spending time with friends and family, it's really about knowing what your priorities are, what your values are, and mentoring yourself in that direction. And a recent study looked at uh, self-compassion specifically among cancer survivors. Uh, and they were identifying the different psychological processes that were predicting better, better psychological outcomes over time among cancer survivors. And it just so happens that what they were identifying sounds exactly like self-compassion. So for example, uh, many women who had a really positive psychological recovery during treatment and after treatment, uh, one of the things they did was they stopped putting pressure on themselves to be relentlessly positive. A lot of times people feel this pressure, like, like you have to stay really optimistic all the time, and it turns out to be really healthy and really helpful to, to not put that pressure on yourself. Uh, and to not always think about making other people feel better about the fact that you're suffering. And that giving yourself permission to acknowledge the stress, the pain, and the suffering is really important. That's that mindfulness element of self-compassion. Uh, they also found that among people who, who were recovering well from cancer, that they started to look around the world and see suffering where maybe they hadn't seen it before. And again, that doesn't sound like a good thing. Like, well, why would we want to look around at the world and see suffering? But uh, again, it's that reminder that we're not alone in our suffering. And on the other side of the scale, a lot of times after either uh, you experience cancer or you uh, have a loved one who experiences cancer, 
Uh, people often feel very lonely after that. They feel more isolated, not more connected, that other people just don't understand the way the world works and the way that they do. And uh, being able to actually see that others might be suffering and you just don't know it, in the same way that people can look at you and maybe they don't know that you have or had cancer. They don't know uh, the, the burden of being a caregiver because you're not necessarily showing it on the outside. People begin to see that that may be true of others as well. And that's a really important part of the healing process. And then the last element that they identified was a greater willingness, again, just to honor your own priorities and values, to say, all right, now this is a wake-up call, and I'm going to stop doing what I think other people want me to do, and I'm going to do the things that matter to me. And that's that element of self-kindness. So we're going to do a practice together that is one of the self-compassion practices that I teach in my work at the Stanford Center for Compassion and Altruism. And this is probably the simplest practice of self-compassion in that it doesn't have a lot of steps. But it doesn't mean that it's always easy for people. Um, we're going to give it a try now. And if it intrigues you, I encourage you to take this practice home with you and start to really develop it. Because it's the kind of practice that the more you do it, the more supportive it becomes. And the first time we do it is not necessarily the, the full reveal of how helpful it can be over time. So if you're willing to try this out now, let's just take a couple of minutes. Again, I invite you to come into a comfortable position with your body and to close your eyes or to drop your gaze. And notice your breath. Just come home to the breath again and again. And if you enjoyed either the feeling of belly breathing or the image of heart breathing, breathing into and out of the heart center, take the next few moments and go back to those practices, the belly breathing or the heart breathing. And I'd like you to bring to mind some symbol of compassion. And we'll define compassion as having many qualities, acceptance, wisdom, caring, support, and strength. And I'd like you to just let the mind dance around this idea and see if there is an image, a person, perhaps a religious figure, or even a very abstract idea, like a sun that shines its warmth and light on all beings without discrimination, or an expansive blue sky that is spacious enough to hold all experiences. What for you represents the quality of compassion. And if nothing comes to mind, why not choose that idea of the open blue sky? And I'd like you to imagine now that you are in the presence of this compassion image, whether it's a person, a religious figure, that blue sky, the warm sun, whatever it is. Imagine yourself in its presence and being the recipient of its compassion. Allow yourself to feel that you are the recipient of great compassion. few more breaths here, perhaps dropping the image and just coming home to the feeling of the breath in your body. Opening your eyes if the eyes are closed. So this practice, when done regularly, when strengthened so that you actually can feel yourself the recipient of this compassion, 
It's been demonstrated to reduce depression and anxiety and really help people become less self-critical, less hard on themselves, and more of the mentor for themselves. People who do regularly do this practice are more likely to, uh, to honor their own needs and follow their own priorities. Now here's another intervention that you can do that we won't do together today, but that you could do when you go home tonight or any time that you'd like. This is a study that asks people to write a compassionate letter to themselves. And the researchers said, tonight when you go home, I just want you to think about the most stressful thing that happened to you today, or whatever is the most upsetting situation in your life right now, wherever the suffering is. And I want you to write just a short paragraph to yourself in which you demonstrate these qualities of self-compassion. So you might write the letter and using the, the writing it to you, so dear you, I know that you are under a lot of stress right now. I know that you are feeling, and then describing what you're feeling, and writing this letter acknowledging mindfulness of your own stress or suffering. And then think, what would you say to a dear friend in this situation, the situation that you're in? And say those things to yourself. You might remind yourself of your common humanity by saying things like, I know it feels like you're the only one going through this right now. But you might remember that countless other beings are also experiencing this in this moment. And your willingness to be present for what's happening to you may actually be a source of support and strength to them. And then you could also say whatever it is that you need to hear to feel really understood and supported. So when researchers ask people to do this once a day for one week, check out these results. Get all the pictures. Oh. Get all the pictures up there. Okay, so here you see depression. They did this for one week. They followed them for six months. And the people who did the letter writing, that's the, um, that's the intervention, the red bars, they showed significant declines in depression all the way through six months after they wrote the letter to themselves for you know, once a day for one week. And that's because writing this type of letter to yourself teaches you a new way of be, being that support and being that healing presence for yourself. And you see similar findings for happiness, that is over time they became more and more happy over six months, whereas the, uh, the control group did not. The control group was writing about early childhood experiences, so you sort of scratch that one off your list if you're, if you're thinking about that. And uh, again, we often don't think that writing about and thinking about our own suffering is gonna be helpful we often anticipate it's just gonna make us feel worse. Um, but research suggests that there are really two very different ways of thinking about your own suffering and stress. And this is a brain imaging study that had people think about something upsetting in two different ways. One was the default, where they just said, think about it. And most of us, the way we think about it is, we fly into anxieties, we wonder about what it all means, we take a very negative view of ourselves or our lives. Uh, and when people do that, the areas of the brain that become activated are the areas associated with, not surprisingly, self-criticism, self-inhibition, and the areas that light up when you're being punished by someone else. So the way we typically think about our own stress and suffering is equivalent to punishing ourselves. But when people were taught how to think about their own stress and suffering in a self-compassionate way, the way that I've just described to you, it activated a completely different system of the brain the one that is associated with caregiving, when you see a puppy and you pick it up, mm -hmm. or when you hug your loved one, uh, when you take really good care of someone and feel connected to them. These are the areas of the brain that were activated when people were thinking about the exact same situation, but from the self-compassionate point of view that I described. The last thing that I wanna share with you uh, is just to encourage you to really act on everything that you've heard today. So you've heard about nutrition, you've heard about lifestyle changes, and there's some wonderful work happening locally at the Preventative uh, Medical Research Institute uh, that looks at what happens when people with chronic disease or cancer, so heart disease, cancer, other illnesses, when they change a lot of things at once. So in this program, you do some simple walking, okay, so you get some physical activity, as well as some gentle yoga. You learn simple meditation techniques like the ones that we've described and done. You also have some social supports. So you're doing it in a group, which is really wonderful. And you're also encouraged to eat uh, a mostly vegan diet, mostly plant-based vegetarian diet. 
And I'm going to show you one study, although they have so many wonderful studies coming out showing the benefits of making these changes. This is a study of men who had prostate cancer, who were taking the wait and see approach that is now so often recommended uh, for men with prostate cancer. So they weren't undergoing radical treatment. And all they did were the lifestyle changes that I just described. So what you're looking at here is a heat map that shows the expression of genes in a biopsy of tissue from the prostate of men with prostate cancer. Before the lifestyle changes, they did a biopsy. After the lifestyle changes, they did a biopsy. And they looked at which genes are being expressed. Because you know, we're all born with genes, but what we do in our life changes which genes are expressed and which genes are inhibited. And that includes what we eat and whether we exercise or not. And what they found, if you look at the green boxes on the right, this is after the intervention, all of those, uh, those genes that are now green, those are cancer-promoting genes. And they were down-regulated or turned off based on these lifestyle changes. The genes that were up-regulated were cancer-healing uh, or cancer-preventing genes, including genes that help uh, block tumor formation and growth. And this is just one of the many phenomenal studies, uh, pieces of evidence that suggest making lifestyle changes has a real effect on our well-being and on our recovery. And it's not, just, it's not just one small drop in the bucket, but can be a really important source of strength and healing over time. And so I hope that this study and some of the other studies that I showed you encourage you to become that healing presence for yourself and cultivate these qualities of mindfulness and self-compassion and do some of these practices, whether it's yoga or exercise or changing your diet, uh, that will be so supportive. So with that said, I'm, here are those websites again that I mentioned if you want to jot them down now, and I'll leave them up. Um, and best of luck on your healing journey. And I believe what happens next is happening over there. They're doing book signings, is that right? Mm -hmm. Is that right? So, yes. Thank you, Kelly. That was wonderful. Wow, what a day. Thank you so much for participating with us and creating a, a, a